Hey Becky and welcome to today's Coffee and Chat video. Nice to have you on the channel. Um, so Becky is a fellow third year engineer now. And well, you're... fourth year engineer now. Oh sorry, fourth years. Oh yeah, god, yeah, yes. Yeah. Time flies. <laughs> <laughs> and Becky did natural sciences for the first few years and then switched off to medicine, oh, sorry, engineering. Two new subjects there. Engineering for the, for the last two. And Becky has been involved in a lot of really cool projects, particularly with water purification in the developing world. And yeah. so I thought you guys would find it really interesting to have Becky's opinion on things and Becky's insight into what she's done. So Becky, please introduce yourself to the, to the channel. Okay, hi, I'm Becky. As um, Sam said, I'm a fourth year engineer. Um, and in my first year of um, my degree here at Cambridge, um, I helped to um, start BleeTap, which is a social enterprise working on water purification in developing countries. That's really cool. So BleeTap in general, getting straight into it. It's a really cool bit of technology where you can fit a water purification system to any water system in the world, right? So we work really with um, like clear piped water. Right. So we're really focusing on urban environments um, and less so on rural environments. Okay, sure. Uh, What's the stat about who doesn't have clean water? Well, I mean like a huge amount, our market is huge. Right. Um, the stat that really sinks in for me is that like diarrheal disease is still the second leading cause of under fives. Oh really? Uh, that okay. resonates with me because it's such like a young time to be dying of something like such as So infant mortality is very high because I guess they, if the water's contaminated, they go and drink that water. Yeah. Then so it gets after a while, something. I think your kind of immunity to dirty water mm. builds up. But yeah, it's still like diarrhea being the second leading cause of under fives from drinking dirty water for me is um, quite but, clearly <laughs> a huge problem. Sure. And of course, the interesting part of your story is how you got involved with the project and how you've helped develop it so far. Yeah. Because I think it started off you guys working really hard, now you're winning lots of prizes and awards to even further the idea. Yeah, yeah. So tell us more about the timescale of things and when you got involved and how far you've come. Yeah, so Francesca, our founder, um, began the project in Mexico City sure. um, quite a number of years ago now, working right. with Engineers Without Borders. Mm, okay, so like Médecins Sans Frontières, the But the, the version of that for engineers. Okay, it was actually cool. started in Cambridge oh, really? as well, Engineers Without Borders. Everything starts in Cambridge, doesn't it? <laughs> so smugly. Um, yeah, so she started that in Mexico City, but the prototype was very rough. It didn't work very well, to be honest. Um, and she went away for a number of years. And then when she came to Cambridge to start a PhD, um, 3D printing had just started to kind of become sure. a little bit more popular. Okay, the okay. Dyson Centre in the engineering department has 3D printers. Yes, I guess you go there with the CAD machines, you program it and it prints whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. And now we have our own, which is a super cool laser 3D printer. Right. Um, so instead of printing layer by layer, mm. it puts like a layer of resin on and then lasers it off into the right shape. It makes it more precise. Really? 3D printing is really advantageous because it really, really speeds up how fast you can prototype things. If we want to try something a bit different in our setup, we just go and print it, it'll be ready for the next day. Mm. But before 3D printing, you'd have to send it off to an external company and it would be a few days to a week for every new prototype. Now we must have gone through like uh, at least a hundred prototypes. Gosh, so yes. it really, really speeds up the development of innovation. And um, the more iterations you have, I guess the faster you can see what works, what doesn't work. Exactly. And you can really get a design which is really good at uh, what it does. Exactly. Okay, well that's 3D printing. Back to yeah, what you're saying. So, so. Um, <laughs> Chess came to Cambridge and yep. she really, she knew that it was um, something that's really needed in the world. She'd ordered a chlorine injector um, when she worked with MSF mm -hmm. as a water engineer and it sure. cost £1,500. <laughs> Um, and it was actually really difficult to maintain. She said right. she needed her engineering degree just to be able to keep up with this chlorine injector. Um, and was this chlorine injector designed for developing countries even, or was it more It was for more designed for humanitarian contexts. Right. Okay. So humanitarian is kind of more like short-term aid, war zones, um, famine. After an earthquake or something. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Whereas development is about changing things for the long term. Mm. So the, the, the reason why that one was so expensive was because it was designed to just be able to cope with absolutely everything. Sure. Whereas for kind of a household, the water is going to be fairly consistent. It doesn't need to get rid of chemicals that you might find. Um, but basically, another reason that it's £1,500 is people charge what people will pay. Sure. And the NGOs and the hotels will They will, will pay, pay whatever. Yeah. Is needed. But it means that it doesn't get to the people that, well, 
actually need it. Really need it in their house. Um, so that's. So there's a need. Then you need yeah. the need. The need for a cost-effective, effective water cleaning device. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I joined Francesca right in my first year. It was like my second week here or something. And yeah, in the summer there, I went to Tanzania with CDI, mm -hmm. um, where again, the water problem is huge. We generally tended to drink bottled water. What's CDI? You explain. Um, the Cambridge Development Initiative. Sure. It's a two-week voluntary um, program in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam. Okay. Um, I stress very, very strongly that it's not voluntourism. So okay. voluntourism is kind of these holiday packages. So you go to like an African country, you play with the kids. An orphanage. Gosh, that gosh. is so damaging. You have like classic cases of orphanages actually like treating their children worse so that they look poorer, so that people feel like they've had more of an impact. People coming in to teach for you know two weeks at a time, bonding with children and then leaving again. That's so psychologically damaging. So I will stress that this. We were always very careful on CDI that although it is volunteering, it wasn't voluntourism. Um, so yeah, I ran an entrepreneurship course out there. We partner with students at the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, but whilst we were there, we only drank bottled water. And the students there also only drink bottled water. Even in Sri Lanka, my parents always say, even the bottled water, she's like, no, don't trust that. Boil the water, then drink it. Boiling the water won't protect it from recontamination, but okay. in Uganda, for example, my friend Eunice um, boils her water. Mm. But she boils it, and a lot of people in Uganda, the most popular method is boiling. Yes. Right. But they'll boil it over like a wood fire or right. a charcoal fire, yeah. which inhales so much smoke mm. from doing that every single day. And it's also quite expensive. The charcoal to buy it can be quite expensive. Um, and they have to boil kind of at least two big pans every day. So like the smoke inhalation from that. I read recently somewhere that actually 600,000 Africans die, die every single year from smoke-related causes. I think recently someone, um, there's an idea, a startup idea for um, coconut husk briquette or something. Okay. Or even cow dung briquettes. Yeah. It's a sustainable way of burning fuel. However, the damage caused by the smoke they inhale is far worse than yes. other means of. Yeah. You know, they fuel. are starting to design new stoves. So, one of the businesses I worked, I helped to start in mm. Tanzania yep. was um, a new design of smoke to try and like reduce the amount, like increase the efficiency of the burning, to less decrease the amount of smoke, tar, that, yeah. and to deal with that in a better way so that people don't inhale it. Mm. Um, they were a really exciting company. They got um, actually some investment by the end of our trip there. Fantastic. So, there is things like that, but at the moment, the smoke inhalation is still a huge problem and that's my concern with boiling water is sure. it doesn't protect against recontamination and my friend Eunice is sat there inhaling a lot of smoke every single day. So you went to Tanzania, Tanzania the first time yeah. and first year you did a lot of work for it and how did it develop from then? So um, basically there were kind of two joint things. We developed the business model with the help of mentors. Um, and people that we met through like business competitions mm. and that's also how we got our money and we'd get various grants. Mm. On the other hand, we were also working on the technology. So right. Tom Stakes is our CTO, you know, he's printing new prototypes, we're doing the maths um, and I kind of work, I work a lot on the business development but I'm always a spare pair of hands in the lab which yeah. is quite cool because then I get to see like both the technology development and the business development. Right, sure. um, so I spend like six six weeks last summer in the lab testing wow. and we went to Uganda and we learned more about the specific setups there. So as well as spending time in the lab here in Cambridge, you're going on the field seeing if your sort of new prototypes are meeting the demands or not. Yeah, exactly. So we spoke to local plumbers. Um, a key part of our business model actually is working with local plumbers. Sure. So maintenance of water technology is um, it's done really badly. Um, like quite a lot of, you see like a lot of charities doing say pumps or boreholes um, and actually quite a large number of these can break down quite quickly right. um, because there aren't the parts locally available mm. and people haven't been taught to maintain them properly. So our model um, has kind of plumbers as our franchisees, mm. they're really the heart of our business. They're already trusted by the community yep. which helps us helps us convince and implement the, the community sort of yes, that yes. we are trustworthy and yes. what we're doing makes their water safe to drink because that is that is huge and quite often overlooked and it also empowers them to like grow their businesses yeah um, when we spoke to the planet plumbers they were really enthusiastic about our technology we had people come up to us at the end and ask where they could get chlorine from because right. they understood so quickly that 
that is the best method the World Health the Organization yes, yes. like says that it's probably the most effective um, and they really understood the plumbing really well they had really great suggestions for improving the device yeah and then we asked them about their businesses and it was stone cold silence we asked them kind of what aspects they wanted to learn about advertising or ga gaining customers and they were just like mm, we'd like to know a bit more but we don't even know what we don't really know and when we spoke to the leader um, so, so what do you mean by that so like is it because their knowledge of plumbing was only very trivial or do they want no, to learn no, no, more no. or what was as it as in their knowledge of plumbing was amazing right but when we spoke to um, a friend of ours in Uganda he actually said that um, a lot of the plumbers can sometimes lose money on the jobs that they do so they kind of they cost up what they think say a new head attack or rainwater harvesting rig they cost that up yeah. and they buy the parts and they do the labor right but quite often they don't cost it up quite right and they end up losing money on jobs right even sure. though they've done the work yes yes so the kind of the plumbing is that they're, they're really technically gifted yes um but what we can offer is um, training on how to cost up jobs effectively, give them a product which makes them a profit, yes. um, which they don't do at the moment, um, and give them training about kind of how to keep loyalty with customers mm. or mm. how to advertise their services better so that they get more customers. So um, what I see so far is you've managed to get a business together, which is amazing. The end user benefits. Yeah. The people installing it benefit a lot by yeah. improved quality of life. And you guys, as a company, are always innovating. You're trying to improve the technology. So it seems like a fantastic model so far. It's really cool. Well, but everything's more difficult in practice, yeah. in theory. Um, you know, it can, it can be really difficult to convince people to to buy stuff. Mm. Um, we're working really hard with our customers to make it exactly what they need, um, and hopefully that will help us. Um, so just moving on into you, you develop this product. The way it works is it chlorinates the water. You get some clean water coming out. Very good for, I guess, dense populations and very like busy urban cities. You mentioned. Yeah, yes. urban environments are better. Um, rural populations are um, incredibly poor, and I almost see that as a, a humanitarian context rather than a development one. Right. Uh, we went to visit um, Tear Fund, who are a water charity, um, in Kabali in Uganda, mm -hmm. and. Um, a core value of theirs is that beneficiaries should pay for technology because then they take better care of it. And that's something that we're really passionate about too. But the contributions that they were asking for, um, some people in the rural areas couldn't actually afford a pound a year yeah. to contribute to the... Um, to the maintenance, huge numbers of rural sustenance farmers in the world. I so not, didn't realise that. No. Sustenance farmers like some of the like poorest people in the world, and I'm actually another interest of mine is agritech because like um, obviously there's huge problems with food scarcity. It's going to be more of an issue. I read somewhere that like um, when when you have a coffee, like the average amount that the coffee farmers will actually earn among the group of beans, yeah. like one pence for like every coffee that you drink, if that. Okay. For all of you out there watching. I'm sure they also have like lots of good ideas that they maybe have seen for problems in the real world. Yeah. Given your experience, how would you recommend that they go about taking an action on what they've seen? So if they've seen it um, out on the travel, on, out on their travels, yeah. Um, a, a really good team is crucial. Right. Um, I'm very lucky in that Chess is super experienced. Yes. Um, and our skills work really well together. Tom is an absolute technical whiz. Yeah. Chess has really good people skills right. um, and she's got a lot of experience. Yeah. Um, and I've been very interested in business development from quite a young age. So number one, get a technical. good team. Find people who've got different skills that you can yeah. work together with and don't also argue. that you get on really well with. Yeah. Um, a person said to me recently that like, you should essentially be prepared to marry your co-founders. Yeah. Um, I'm staying with Chess at the moment whilst I work on Blue Tap and I think it's absolutely true that you need people that you trust and get on really well with. Otherwise it just makes, because you're working for so long, yeah. for so much of the day together, yeah. if you just can't get on, yeah. a small sort of disagreement will turn something bigger to yeah. wreck the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, be prepared to marry your co-founder, <laughs> maybe not, but I certainly get on with my team. Is that a good thing to do? <laughs> Write the problem down, brainstorm some ideas? or Yeah, so <laughs> looking at um, the human-centered design framework was what right. we use to set up businesses in Tanzania. Okay. Um, if you research the human-centered design framework, it kind of goes like, 
human tends to design. empathize yep. step one which is kind of observing the problem getting yep. to know the people okay. um, defining the problem okay. um, in like a sentence that's super clear yeah um, and then ideation, which right. is brainstorming the answers. Sure. Um, prototype. Go out and make it. A lot of people have really cool ideas, but um, just go out and make it. Stop theorizing yeah, about it. Yeah, stop and just go and have a go and have a go. Because when you go to kind of, because um, you'll need money. We we go through competitions a lot of, um, especially if you're a student. There's loads of really good competitions. Um, I guess if you're passionate as well, the competitions will be quite easy. If you've seen yeah. a problem, you've got a good idea for it. Yeah. Go to the competitions. Solve your idea. But having a prototype, just showing that you've started. It's not a theory, it's not just an idea. Give me ten steps ahead of other teams. Even if it's made of cardboard, yeah. um, prototyping is really key. Okay. And then testing it and starting the cycle again. Okay, brilliant. And then the third key tip would be... Um, you need money. Okay, and money and resilience, I guess. Or... Yeah, money and resilience. Um, well, you need money to make a prototype. Okay, um, sure. Everything we do is very low cost, but you need a bit okay. um, to make So let's say stuff. someone watching has an idea, has the idea, <laughs> but doesn't have the money. How yeah. do they go about that? So there are so many competitions. Okay. Um, we've got all our money through competitions. Um, we had a grant from the Environment Now programme. Okay. Um, we won Cambridge University Entrepreneurs. If you're at university, there's things like the Santander competition. Right, there's also um, like, um, you call them accelerators. Incubator, so mm, incubator. we're in the Centre for Global Equality Cultivator here right. in Cambridge. Okay, sure. That's been really useful. Um, we've met loads of similar organisations. Um, they're really good for helping us to find partners to test with. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, an incubator is a really good idea. To um, so get money as well then. So. But yeah, competitions would be the main source of money. And there is uh, joining kind of mailing lists. Mailing lists. There's quite a lot of my competitions just come through my inbox. It's now at the point where Facebook are advertising competitions at me because they know that I spend so long searching for them. Um, so really look out for the opportunities where you can take your idea to the next level. Then hopefully then you have a good idea, you've made a prototype, yeah. you've marketed it, and like you are doing, you're on the field, testing it and iterating it. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah. my battery's going to die. So, Sorry. Um, no, it's my fault. Um, thank you so much, Becky, for coming. Yeah, no, time. it's just fun. If you guys have any questions sort of about more of what you've done, yeah. Maybe people who want to even get like involved on a lower level with your blue tap work. Yeah, well, if you want to get involved on a lower level, we sell reusable water bottles. Okay, sure. Um, that fund all our work to develop our technology. Okay, sure. Um, I'll put a photo here. Ding. Yeah. Okay, great. Online and yeah. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Becky. As always. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys soon in the next uh, coffee and chat video. Yeah. Thank cool. you, Becky. See you guys soon. All the best. <laughs>